Hello everybody, uh, my name is Jim Ibbinson and this uh, morning I'm going to talk about the pharmacology of anesthetic gases uh, and vapors. I have nothing to disclose uh, other than the fact that I want to talk about these six major areas. Um, when I looked at the keywords for the board exams, this is really the way I thought you could group a lot of these when trying to really just talk about um, the agents. Uh, I will say that when you get into, say, the neuromodules or the um, cardiac modules, you'll talk more about the effects of the inhalational agents in those realms. I'm just going to provide a quick overview of those within, within this talk. The first place I always like to start when talking about the gases um, is to, you know, to try to give an understanding of them is really just to talk about how they work. Well, uh, as most of you know, we really don't know. Um, there's lots of thoughts, uh, but there's also lots of questions that still exist. Things we do know, though. We do know that the inhalational agents cause uh, immobility, and this is really what we're measuring when we're measuring the MAC. Um, we're really talking about uh, how many, what percentage of people move to a surgical incision, standardized incision. Um, and if you've, you all know that one MAC is where 50% of the population would not move to that incision. Now we know that this happens via spinal cord interactions through various experiments um, where we've essentially isolated the spinal cord uh, and still seen uh, effects from the um, inhalational agents. So there must be some sort of spinal cord activity for inhalational agents, but of course they work in the brain as well. Um, and we know that because they provide the biggest thing, amnesia. Uh, this means that it must involve areas like the amygdala and the hippocampus because these are big memory areas. There's lots of others that I'm sure are involved. And those proposed mechanisms for the inhalationals really lie within a couple realms. We think that they act to enhance the inhibitory actions of both GABA and glycine. We also think, though, that they block excitation um, at NMDA receptors. Um, both of these are probably in play, probably at different proportions for different agents. But again, this is still an area of a lot of active research. The bigger thing, though, the more practical thing, is really just to talk about the MAC. Um, and so MAC, being that it tells us what, what percentage of gas concentration, if you will, of gas that we have to get to to keep folks um, immobile, uh, it tells us a bit about the potency of the gas as well. And so we can look at this and we can see that something like halothane, where the MAC is very low, is going to be a very potent gas, where desflurane at 6 right next to it uh, is not going to be quite so potent. Um, again, this, this is when we talk about agent potency, these are the kind of things we're talking about, but it doesn't really mean we're talking about how they come on or off. We'll talk about that in a second. Lots of things can affect MAC, and unfortunately, there's just no good way, I, I think, of learning these other than just memorizing them. There are a lot of things that can end up causing um, an increased MAC, essentially, meaning that to get that 50th, uh, that 50% of folks in mobile, you're going to have to increase the medication. There's also a lot of different things that can decrease MAC as well. Uh, and again, I can't provide a whole lot of guidance other than just looking at this list and trying to memorize it, maybe trying to see if you can see some patterns within it. Now when we continue to talk about the agents, I think a commonly tested uh, aspects of these are some of the physical properties and so I wanted to bring up two of them in particular, the first being vapor pressure. When we're using our vaporizers, each of them is designed for a particular agent <clears throat> and we have to keep that in mind because if you put the wrong agent into a vaporizer, you're going to get a different effect. Uh, this is a very commonly tested area. If the vapor pressures of the agents are close to each other, like sevoflurane and enflurane, or isoflurane and, and halothane, then you end up getting pretty similar activities, um, pretty in terms of the you know amount of of uh, anesthetic action from a from a various concentration. But if you change these, then the concentration of the gas um, could be higher when the vapor pressure is higher. Again, the the vaporizer is designed to deliver. Um, let's pretend it's designed to deliver sevoflurane. It's expecting a certain vapor pressure. If we give it more of a vapor pressure, then more is going to come out of that um, vaporizer than we intended, and so our concentration is going to be higher. 
So knowing which what the effects are if you put the wrong vaporizer in, sorry, the wrong agent in the wrong vaporizer, um, commonly tested in something that I think is good to know. The other thing, of course, is understanding the blood gas coefficients. And so when we give our anesthetic agent um, the amount that's in the lungs gets gets lowered by the basically being dissolved and, and carried away in the blood. And so this can drop that, um, the fraction that we have sitting in our alveoli. That's what this FA is. We can examine this with um, FA over FI plots. And what this really describes is sort of the, the way in which the agent reaches its steady state concentration for each of the different gases. And for the most part, you can see that these um, just follow along by that potency that we were talking about before, where we have uh, desflurane and nitrous way up here high. Um, we also have um, you know, agent like halothane um, way down here below, meaning it takes a while for halothane to come up to what is going to end up being at steady state concentration. Now what we can figure figure out from these curves is that it really matches this blood gas coefficient. And so here we have desflurane and, and nitrous very similar to each other. Um, desflurane's coefficient is a little bit higher than nitrous's, and we'll talk about that in a second. But when you look at these co blood gas coefficients, you can see that the speed of the induction mirrors these. So halothane has the, the highest of these, and so it's the slowest agent. Nitrous and, and des, though, and the comparison between the two really requires a, a little bit more consideration. If their coefficients are that, um, and, and des is, is actually a little bit different, how can, we, how can we end up having nitrous end up coming in faster? Well, the answer really is the concentration effect, um, or it's, it's sort of special application being the second gas effect. And so when we talk about this, what are we talking about? The concentration effect has two different parts. The first of them being the concentrating effect. And so let's just consider this for a second. Let's pretend we're giving uh, a gas at a 10% mix right here, where we have 90% of some inert, um, you know, be it nitrogen, and then we have 10 parts of our gas that, that, you know, this inhalational agent that we're giving. And let's say this gas is absorbed at a pretty high amount, something like 50%. What that means is that we're going to end up moving to having five parts of our gas that'll be left over because this five has been absorbed away in a mixture of, of 95 uh, parts of an inert. So here we had 10% concentration coming in. After this absorption, we're left here with 5.3%. With, uh, okay, fine. Now what happens when we move to a uh, different gas? Let's pretend we've got a gas um, that we're going to deliver at um, uh, fifth, the same gas, I'm sorry, that we're going to deliver at 50% um, and have 50% absorbed. So this gas, we're going to give it a much higher concentration. What ends up happening now is we moved from a 50% um, um, concentration to what works out to be a 33%. This is absorbed, and these two are still sitting in the lungs. And so when we went from 10 to 50, that's a change in five times the concentration but it ended up actually giving us a jump from 5.3 to 33, or a 6.2 uh, greater concentration in the alveoli. Um, this is a way, one way in which um, nitrous ends up being a little bit faster because it, and it gets absorbed at such a high amount that it, it ends up getting concentrated within the lungs. So again, this is the concentrating effect of, of the concentration effect. Now the other part happens with the next breath. <clears throat> so let's take that same situation <clears throat> where we had 90 parts of our inert and we have five parts of agent left and we're going to take another breath and we're going to fill this five parts that was absorbed. We're going to fill it back up. When we fill it back up, we end up throwing another half part of, of gas in there. And um, so the concentration now becomes, um, this should actually be a 0.5 right here. Sorry about that. So we end up with... Um, Oh, no, it shouldn't. Actually, this adds up to 100. That's just fine. We end up with 5.5% um, from the 5.3%. When we have that case where we were delivering the gas at a higher concentration, we end up getting 12 parts, again, 50% of this after a breath and some absorption. And so we've moved from 33% to 37.5%. So what does that mean? Again, when we went from 
10% to 50%, giving five times the agent, we actually got a 6.8% jump. We were at 62 with that first breath before on the concentrating effect part. Now we've added the augmented inflow, we moved to 68 so these two things are the really make up the concentration effect and are a big um, theoretical consideration when we're talking about gases. Now, why do I say theoretical? Well, because most of the gases that we give, we don't give it these sorts of concentrations. Uh, remember, desfluorine's MAC is about 6%, so it's nowhere near the 50%. Um, so, you know, where does it become practical? It really only becomes practical with nitrous, and that's why we talk about the second gas effect. Um, the second gas effect is just the concentration effect only when we're talking about nitrous. Um, so nitrous and oxygen versus nitrous with another agent becomes second gas. Nit nitrous is absorbed rapidly, and that loss into the blood with some sitting here within the lungs still leads to that increased concentration um, that you end up seeing. So if the test question comes up and has um, nitrous with an agent versus nitrous and oxygen, you're talking about the second gas effect. And that's what I've seen tested most commonly. Of course, the other tissues of the body end up having an effect as well um, on how the agents end up um, coming on and going away. Um, so elimination, recovery are uh, affected by the amount of agent in muscle and the fat. And how so? Well, for very short cases, muscle and fat stores can act as a reservoir, essentially. They can continue to take up, uh, agents from the blood and end up speeding the decrease in, that, um, in the agent's concentration or partial pressure that it's exerting within the brain. And so it can speed up um, the recovery from a case. Um, but if you have a long case, then the agents will end up saturating the muscle and fat tissues. And so what you're going to end up needing is for those to unload um, before our brain partial pressure gets low enough for the patient to wake up. So in, in this case, um, those compartments will slow recovery. And, and correlating or accounting for all of those um, sort of interplays between these here is really where the art of anesthesia comes in. Now, of course, this effect is greatest with the soluble agents, um, things like halothane. Well, now, uh, as we move to the final portion, we're going to talk about the uh, effects of the inhaled anesthetics on the various systems. And as I said, this is just sort of a summary, uh, a generalization overall. So when we talk about the cardiovascular system, inhaled agents are going to end up decreasing uh, the mean arterial pressure, and they're going to end up increasing heart rate for the most part. Um, if you're talking about the respiratory system, you get a decrease in tidal volume and an increase in the respiratory rate. With the central nervous system, in general, you'll see a decrease in CMRO2, and you'll end up seeing an increase in the cerebral blood flow and in intracranial pressure as well. In the hepatic system, you end up getting a what can usually be a mild enzyme bump to flat out frank necrosis, uh, depending on the agent. Within the renal system, I think the effects are minimal. Um, of course, you do have to consider though compound A and sevoflurane. Within the neuromuscular system, there is uh, a relaxation and uh, potentiation really um, that occurs with the inhalational agents, not to the point where they could be used without any neuromuscular blockade, um, but often they will enhance and prolong neuromuscular blockade. And of course, there's lots of others as well. Um, immune is one that I have listed here um, to be considered, but if you're looking for high yield topics, I'm not sure that that would be one. I wanted to probe a little bit deeper into the cardiovascular respiratory and to the CNS effects, and so that's what we're going to move into next. First thing that I had mentioned was that the inhalationals decrease the mean arterial pressure, and that's what we can see in this graph here. Um, you see that as the MAC increases, all of the mean arterial pressures end up dropping from the four major agents that we have. The reason that they drop, though, is different. Um, so in this case, what we're looking at is the systemic resistance, and you can see that for um, all the agents besides halothane, the SVR is what really drops when these agents are given. For halothane, it stays pretty constant. Um, halothane ends up suffering and dropping as MAC increases in terms of cardiac output. That's what's graphed along here in liters, in liters per minute. So um, 
the drop that you see in blood pressure from halothane is really due to the drop in cardiac output that we see here where it's probably more related to that change in uh, SVR with the other agents. So that got me to wondering actually. Um, if we end up seeing um, that drop in SVR, what, what else is going on with the agents? Well, what you can end up finding is that as MAC increases, you actually get an increase in central venous pressure um, uh, you know, from the awake value, and that's what we're the awake value being here. This is a difference that they've plotted on the y-axis. And so you can see that as, the, as we increase our agent, our central venous pressure goes up. So if we have an increase in central venous pressure, it means we, our preload is increasing. I already mentioned that that, that uh, SVR, the resistance, and it decreases. And so how come we don't get a big rise for all the agents in cardiac output? Remember, that stayed pretty flat. Well, the reason's pretty simple, actually. All the agents are myocardiodepressants as well, and that's something that you have to keep in mind in terms of the cardiovascular effects in general. Now, what happens when we add, add nitrous? Because this is something that happens um, very commonly within the operating room. Um, and I think this is a great pictorial representation of it. And so you can see that as a percentage of um, awake blood pressure, when we're just using isoflurane, blood pressure can drop down to you know, almost half, um, um, about 60% um, when we're running at a you know, 1.2, 1.3-ish MAC. But if we try to achieve the same MAC level just by backing off the ISO and adding nitrous, we end up getting um, sort of a restoration of our blood pressure. And so what that tells us is that you know, nitrous is probably not as, um, uh, not as depressant on the myocardium, doesn't have quite the same effects when it comes to SVR, and that's true. But that doesn't mean that there are none. If we were to give nitrous alone, you can still see stimulation of the sympathetic nervous system um, although blood pressure, cardiac output, and heart rate aren't really altered. Um, but a uh, bigger deal is that you get a sensitization to catecholamines and to therefore arrhythmias. Um, and nitrous does depress myocardial contractility, especially in patients that are hypovolemic or in patients with significant coronary disease. So the depression act the depressant activity of nitrous uh, in those patients can be profound um, and probably um, uh, can affect the anesthetic care that you're giving. As we continue to think about cardiac effects, we um, should think about cardiac preconditioning. Um, it's one of the one of the, the bigger pros to the inhalational anesthetics, especially for cardiac anesthesia. And what we're really talking about here is the fact that um, you can get this uh, cardio protection from the volatile agents um, by providing for um, smaller ischemic area um, when an area is um, not perfused um, sufficiently. And so um, this happen this occurs with a reperfusion injury as well. It's, it's less when we have inhalational agents on board. And I think a great uh, study that looked at this was just one comparing um, propofol to sevoflurane and following serial troponin levels uh, in cardiac surgery. So you can see that after cardiac surgery, you get quite a bit of a, a troponin bump when using propofol, but when using a pretty standard SIVO um, uh, anesthetic, you end up having you know, relatively flat troponin values. And so it, this really occurs for the other agents as well uh, and probably says that you know, unless we find other ways to, to protect the myocardium, um, TIVA-based approaches are probably not going to replace the inhalationals when it comes to cardiac surgery. So what's the clinical correlation here? Well, pretty much that preconditioning from the inhalationals can give you about 10 more minutes of ischemia time really without worsening outcome overall. Um, there is one small caveat to think about though, and that is that if, you're, if your patient is on agents such as glipizide or glyburide, um, those will need to be discontinued a day or two before uh, the cardiac case in order to be able to um, see this preconditioning benefit. But if your patients then become hyperglycemic, that can prevent preconditioning. So they will have to be put on insulin, which means you may have to have them um, in the hospital with uh, insulin drips and closely watched if you're really benef uh, uh, banking on the preconditioning to, to provide you um, with care during the case. Okay, on to the respiratory effects. 
basic um, things to think about uh, as our MAC increases, the um, uh, arterial CO2 levels it end up increasing within our patients as well. Um, and that's just because our drive, our ventilatory response to CO2 ends up decreasing for all the agents as, um, as the concentration goes up. And they all move in a pretty similar pattern as far as this goes. Um, but there are other respiratory effects that are really important. And one of them being um, it, whether or not you would consider them to be irritating or not. And so in this study, um, they showed that halothane um, ends up um, causing, uh, uh, basically leaving the um, um, contractility of tracheal rings um, at, at their baseline level where it was pretty well affected by iso, or sorry, by sevoflurane and desflurane equally um, but when you, you compare that to this study, looking at SIVO and DES directly, um, and what it showed that is that um, resistance from desflurane can actually go up quite significantly um, during an anesthetic in smokers, um, more so than non-smokers. And so if you have a patient who um, has you know, what you would maybe call irritable airways, um, then desflurane perhaps is not the agent of choice, and maybe SIBO, since it keeps things relatively constant, would be the one that you might want to use. Um, in fact, it can actually act, act to bronchodilate as, as, as well. Some caveats to this, though, none of the gases are highly irritating at sub-anesthetic um, concentrations. Um, and so, you know, what do we mean here? When you add a, you know, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4 MAC of an agent, it's probably not going to have a whole lot of effect. And that may even go up to 0.6 or 0.7. But when you get up over 1 MAC, DES becomes the most irritating to the airways, and then isofluorine, and then sevoflurane. Now, when we turn to CNS effects, uh, the biggest things to talk about are really global um, cerebral blood flow and the uh, cerebral metabolic rate of oxygen, or CMRO2. Rules for this are that nitrous increases CMRO2, but all the others end up decreasing this. The agents also decrease the cerebrovascular resistance, which ends up causing an increase in CBF, or blood flow, and in cerebral blood volume. Uh, and so what, this is what we mean when we say that the inhalational agents uncouple the relationship between CBF and, C, and CMRO2. Um, when we get up over 0.6 MAC, they all end up increasing CBF and, and cerebral blood volume to ways in which uh, might be detrimental for a case um, in a patient with a, a brain lesion. Um, and the, so the, in, the increasing blood volume um, ends up causing an increase in ICP as well. Uh, which is why we don't use high concentrations of inhalationals um, in patients that have uh, large brain tumors. I thought a really interesting study that can highlight this um, uh, effect on ICP is this one that I presented here. And what they end up showing is that um, you know, uh, when uh, we have an anesthetic based on, on propofol and fentanyl, um, we end up with a... a ICP in the 8-ish range here, um, where when using inhalational agents, it's up to about 13. Um, so from 8 or so to about 13, is that a significant effect? Well, it can be, um, especially if their brain is already really tight from a mass lesion. Now, I also think it's interesting to note that um, we can hyperventilate the patients, and it can correct for a good part of this, bringing our values back down to about 9 or 10, which um, is much closer to that value if we were to use a TIVA-based approach. Um, so hyperventilation can help correct it, but the inhalationals certainly do raise ICP uh, to significant levels. Here's a little bit more on that and it really just the time course of these. Know that the different agents can have different time courses here. So um, here's uh, sort of baseline values and as we go along through the case, as we continue to administer desflurane, um, you can see that the um, pressure ends up, this, this being cerebral spinal fluid pressure, ends up rising throughout the case where it stays relatively flat um, for ISO. So for neuro cases, we usually like to use something like desflurane or sevoflurane because they can come off fast. Um, but I think we need to keep in mind the fact that um, the uh, intracranial pressure can rise as the case goes on with, with those agents.
now, of course, the inhalational agents are going to affect evoked potentials as well, and so for neuro, this is going to become a big deal. Um, in general, we can just think in terms of um, the agents decreasing the evoked potentials that we get, and that's what we're showing here. This is the amplitude of an evoked potential, and as we increase MAC, we end up seeing a drop in that um, um, evoked potential amplitude. Now we we can um, you know consider what what happens with or without nitrous as well. When we have nitrous added, they start off quite a bit lower, as you can see. Um, but as we increase our MAC, they stay a little bit flatter. Um, where without nitrous, they continue to decline fairly precipitously as we increase MAC. And so, if this value with nitrous can get you to a spot where um, those evoked potentials um, are sufficient for monitoring, then perhaps it's not a horrible thing to have nitrous going um, with, your, um, with your anesthetic. But if you need those evoked potentials to be at a higher amplitude, then certainly nitrous would be something that you would want to avoid. And so just to summarize for the agents really quickly, with desflurane, its biggest advantages are that um, it's the least soluble as we've sort of gone through here, and so you can have a very rapid recovery from it. Um, it can provide the cerebral and myocardial protection, which um, I think are greater discussed in those, in those uh, modules of the review course. Um, it's also the least metabolized, so something that we didn't address, but that you should know is that it can be used in low flow systems. Um, biggest disadvantages, though, it's quite a pugnant gas, and so inhalational inductions with desflurane would be a difficult thing to accomplish. You can get um, some cardiovascular stimulation as you increase concentration. Um, again, not something we talked about in detail, but something that um, I think it's important to keep in mind here. Now, it's not quite as potent as the other agents, but it's not as bad as nitrous is in terms of the lack of potency. Not sure how much that really matters, um, as we can just provide a little bit more concentration. It should work out just fine. Although, um, keep in mind that uh, there are some links to emergence um, delirium or emergence agitation in children when desflurane is used, and it's thought that it might be a fact of how it uh, how rapidly it it comes off. For sevoflurane, its big advantages are that it's really the ideal agent for inhalational inductions. Um, we don't get any arrhythmogenicity, uh, um, and it has a very low tissue solubility, so it's fast on and fast off. You really don't get a whole lot of cardiovascular stimulation at high concentrations, and if you have airways that are already irritated, it's less irritating than the other agents. Um, now, something that we didn't talk a whole lot about, one of its disadvantages, uh, the MAC bar, or the amount that we have to give to block the autonomic response, is quite high. Um, and so you would have to end up running a very, very deep anesthetic to block that autonomic response. Um, Desflurane is probably a little bit quicker than sevoflurane is, if that's the most important thing. And of course, you need to think about um, degradation by the liver, by CO2 absorbance, the formation of compound A when you're using sevoflurane. You can get agitation during emergence from sevoflurane as well, especially in kids. For isoflurane, um, one of the advantages, um, although I'm not sure I would mention this on an oral board exam, but it, that it's incredibly cheap, and so it's a drug that um, most anesthesiologists have a lot of access to. Um, you get even less degradation um, than desflurane uh, if you end up with a dry absorbent, which can be a problem with desflurane. It uh, stimulates the cardiovascular system less than DES does when, with those concentration changes, and it's probably less irritating to airways than desflurane is. There are disadvantages to isoflurane, though. Recovery is quite a bit slower. You do end up getting more cardiovascular stimulation than SIBO, so it sits in between the two, and it's probably more irritating than SIBOflurane is. Finally, halothane and enflurane I'm going to bring up just because um, you can see questions relating to them. Halothane, um, biggest advantage to it, it's also good for inhalational inductions, um, but it can end up causing problems with uh, uh, hepatic failure, um, and you can get lots of arrhythmias from it. Um, it's also quite a slow agent. Enflurane, um, its biggest problem seem to be seizures. Um, it, so if there, you have questions that deal with enflurane, um, and there's an option that gives you a choice about seizures, that may be the right one to consider. Thank you. That's it for the inhalational agents, and I wish you luck.